I'm joined this morning by uh, a number of people who are going to take you to interesting dimensions of the drought and dry lands question. Uh, just moving along from, uh, from my left hand, we have Egal Eisenberg, and he's from Netafim, uh, which is the company that Ken Quinn just talked about, a real leader in uh, drip irrigation and new forms of irrigation, because it isn't just drip irrigation. You're going to hear some about that. Uh, the next is Roberto Lenton. He's just taken over, I guess it's within the last year now, uh, at the University of Nebraska, setting up uh, a whole water in agriculture unit, which is going to be global in scope, but also very much grounded in the Midwest here. So he's got some very interesting things to talk about. Aditi Mugerji, I hope none of you need uh, an introduction to, because uh, she was last night's first winner of the Research on the Ground Prize, the Norman Borlaug commemorative prize offered by Rockefeller. Uh, really to get in and reward researchers under 40 who have actually got in, got their hands dirty, and started to do the kind of field research that Norm uh, said was necessary to feed the world. And Carl Ganter at the other end, publicist, researcher, photographer, assembler extraordinaire, uh, and recent winner also of the uh, Rockefeller uh, Centennial... Centennial Innovation Grant, which honors the fact that we need much better communicators in the world. So that's what we're going to do. And uh, we're going to try and keep this in a conversational mode with a couple of longer presentations. Uh, and we're really going to try and use the first hour of your day and some of our days by exploring the whole drought and dry land issue. These are pretty scary words, dry lands. We think of them almost as being the same thing. Uh, that a dry land is just something that's ready to turn into a desert, and a desert is something that's about to turn into a drought. Uh, and of course, that's one of the things we're going to be exploring, is that inevitable? And I would like to start off by saying, well, you know, some of the most productive and wealthy zones in the world are dry lands. Uh, Southern California, Australia, Southern Alberta, Morocco, Tunisia. These are dry lands by any standard, even the south of France, parts of Spain. And so clearly, being a dry land area is not the same thing as being a drought area. Uh, but there are movements. When people want to be scary about the world, they talk about the fact that there's two children born per second and that there's an acre comes out of uh, production into, uh, into non-agricultural uses. And then they talk about the number of acres per day, per week, that do turn into desertified areas. So uh, there's obviously some bad forces going on, and I hope the panel this morning is going to talk about some of the, of the forces that we can use to make sure that uh, not every dry land becomes desertified, in fact, less and less of them, and in fact, can we turn this process around? So that's generally a little bit the menu. So we're going to start with what is the real challenge of droughts and dry lands. And Carl Ganter is going to take us on a... Uh, a flying picture, a flying over picture of what drought, what dry lands look like in many parts of the world at the moment, and always with that drought and the desert. Just on the side, Carl. Great, thanks, Maggie. It's great to be here, uh, bright and early in the morning. Um, I also run Circle of Blue, which is a group of journalists and scientists reporting on water, food, and energy uh, issues around the world. So I'm going to take you on a quick four-minute travel log. I have the remote, so I have I have full control of the television. Um, but we're going to start in the Tehuacan Valley. So in Tehuacan, what you see here is a community once known for vibrancy and, and water, even known for its bottled water. And it's drying up in many ways. It's a, it's a dry lands that's changing. Its aquifers are dropping. Um, very significant changes in this region of Tehuacan. Um, we find farmers who are at the front line here in Tehuacan who are for the very first time in their lives, in memory, are actually having to buy water. Their wells were dry when we visited. How do they water their maize? How do they water their corn? So again, big changes occurring in how people manage agriculture and manage their lives. And also when we look at drylands and, and shifts in, in water and precipitation, we also have to look at shifts of people. So we talk about em environmental immigrants. Well, we found Francisca Rosa Valencia, and when we listened to her story, she started to tear up, and she reached for a picture, a picture of her children, her nephew and her son, who she hadn't heard from in more than a year after they'd left to move to the US. So she didn't know if they'd made it. They left because their wells were dry. So other places that we're looking around the world, of course, 
is Iowa, right here in the back, right here in our backyard. So on Tuesday, I went out into the field, quite literally, um, and learned a lot about the corn crop. Learned a lot about the issues. What is drought? What does what is a, a in a sense, a dry area now, and at least this summer, look like. And so corn, um, corn yields were down sometimes 25% of what they normally are. And so I visited this farm. Uh, this is uh, Jeff Hanfer, and it's about an hour west of here. And it looks like a lush farm because it just rained and the grass is green, but yet his ponds are going dry. His well, he can only run for so many hours a day before it goes dry. And now what he said is the images that we saw on television last summer of really dry, cracked land, he said what he's really concerned about is winter and spring when calving season and he doesn't have enough water for his cattle. So again, big changes. Is this a new normal? So on our little travel log, too, I visited, um, I visited this family. This is Wu Yun in Inner Mongolia. And when we talk about dry lands, we have to talk about this nexus of water, food, and energy. So I wanted to take a look at how is this water energy challenge playing out. So in Inner Mongolia, here's Wu Yun standing in the grasslands. This is in December, so of course it's not green, but, but it's also incredibly dry. Their wells have gone dry because of the demands of the coal mines in the background that you see there. She's standing outside the front door of their, of their small little home, their, their winter home. They normally live in a yurt or a gur out in the grasslands. But they now have a dry well. They have to drive 15 kilometers to get water for their sheep. That's the tractor in the background with the tank that they have to drive to get the water. So then also, looking at this water energy challenge, we wanted to back up and look a little deeper into China's challenge specifically. Because what China does, uh, the world, when China talks, the world listens. And this water energy challenge and food, of course, because it's, it's all connected. The water food energy challenge in China is playing out most heavily right now in the energy demand world. So we have three trends converging. We have a country that's growing so fast, it's increasing its use of coal. Coal uses huge amounts of water for processing and also for cooling power plants. So what happens when the energy sector needs lots of water? Well, we've already seen a change. We've already seen in Ningxia province that uh, farmers and coal producers are at odds, that the water accessible for farmers has dropped 30%, at least in 2008. So this is a struggle. This is a really interesting challenge that's unfolding in China and other parts of the world. This is one of their responses. China's responding by policy. They're also responding by massive infrastructure projects. This is the largest industrial infrastructure project on the planet right now, a $100 billion pipeline from the south to the north. Um, also in China, we're seeing all sorts of innovation. Innovation means one hopes optimism, one hopes change. Uh, China's testing all sorts of interesting things. They're testing water rights trading, where in industry and municipalities are investing in agriculture and efficient use of irrigation. So we're seeing that the cities are finding that investment in making agriculture much more efficient in water use brings them more water downstream. So really interesting changes there, too. Um, in the U.S., uh, we, of course, we can't talk about water without talking about the U.S. and drylands and the Colorado River. This is the Arizona project. This brings water from the Colorado River um, to Tucson and to Phoenix. So a week ago, I f did an early morning flight down the Colorado, and this is the lifeblood for Tucson and Phoenix. Now, also, keep on your radar a new report on the Colorado River and climate change coming up in December. And I understand it's going to be very, very stunning. It will be a new, it'll probably be fodder for a drama, a television series called The Real Water World. Um, the next step, too, is around the world looking at Australia, another, another dry lands, a food bowl that was faced with severe drought. This is a rice paddy in the middle of practically the desert here. So we hit the GPS, landed, went and asked the farmer, why are you still growing rice? He said, well, because I'm getting a great price. And his complaint was he had to drill his well deeper every year. That was his complaint to us. Australia is responding. They're responding with some new, uh, new. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. they're responding with um, with <laughs> with um, uh, new carbon and CO2 emission standards and also new ways of managing their water in the Murray Darling Basin. So you remember Wu Yun, but very quickly last week or two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I was out on the grasslands, a two-hour motorcycle ride out to the edge of the desertification. This is this is in the backyard of her sister's in-laws' home 
little gur on the grasslands there. And these are the deserts. This is, this is the actual dunes marching across the grasslands. And so astronaut Jerry Lininger, when he was in Mir in the, in the uh, Soviet space station for five months, he said he would look down and the real connective tissue of the, of, the, of the world that he saw, one was of course water, and he could see these dust storms emanating from Wu Yun's backyard, blowing all the way to Beijing and all the way to Los Angeles. So the drylands, these changes, it connects us all. And then as far as manage, managing them, um, it's one of our greatest challenges, but of course our greatest opportunities to rethink how we, how we get our food and in the water context. Indeed, that was quite a, a bird's eye view of things. And we're going to be talking a lot now about how you try and cope with this. But I want to spend just a few minutes on the overall perspective of what we're seeing here. Uh, is this sufficiently person made that we can actually uh, try and think about turning around some of the root causes? Uh, how, how much of this is climate change? Do we know the difference? Are people studying the, uh, the, the difference? between man-made and climate change? Uh, are there differences in, in prescriptions here? Roberto, do you want to lead us off and just uh, let's exchange some views on, on the overall picture of what we saw there? Maggie, well, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, and Carl, that was a fantastic way to uh, start the proceedings. I think it, was, uh, it, it really showed how the issues of drought and dry land play themselves out uh, in different parts of the world, and the human drama uh, that comes uh, behind that um, and uh, that unfolds in different ways in different places. Um, I think what I'd like to say is a little bit about the, the drought in this part of the world. Um, uh, Carl started out with a couple of slides on Iowa, um, and that certainly brought home to me, um, having just uh, recently moved to the Midwest of the U.S., the issues of of, uh, of drought and water management are absolutely central to this part of the world. Um, and, and part of what we're doing at our institute is trying to learn lessons from the drought in terms of, well, what is it that you can do? Um, and one of the clear lessons uh, is, of course, the importance of, of irrigation. Um, if you take the state of Nebraska um, from a climatical, uh, climatological point of view, it was the hardest hit of all the states. But if you look at it from a production point of view, it was not. Um, so that uh, something was happening in Nebraska that explained that, uh, that difference. Um, and clearly, irrigation is one part of it. Um, the fact that uh, Nebraska has the highest amount of irrigation of all states in the US, it has around 4 million hectares of irrigated land. Um, and if you took Nebraska as a country, it would be about 13th or 14th ranked in the world in terms of irrigated areas. So certainly irrigation had a huge uh, role in terms of coping with the drought. But I think the lessons are go beyond that because my sense is that those farmers who were already, whether they were rain-fed or irrigated, who were already practicing techniques to conserve water, those were the ones that fared the best uh, in this drought. Um, those farmers who were rain-fed, who were uh, practicing uh, no-tillage ways of conserving uh, water in the, in the soil, uh, moisture in the soil, they did better. Those farmers who were uh, irrigated but trying to irrigate with the least amount of water, um, either through uh, um, planting drought-tolerant crops or through uh, installing soil moisture sensors so they were minimizing the amount of water those were the farmers that did the best. Okay, and we've got one of our big experts on that, so I'm going to come to him in a second. He's going to talk about that. Aditi, is there a drought awareness in India? Uh, that sounds like such a banal question, but I mean, does awareness of drought actually change behavior in India, in the places that, uh, that you work? Yes, I mean, um, what I was hoping to talk about is exactly that. I mean, droughts, desperation, and what role irrigation, especially groundwater irrigation, plays in that. So again, like Nebraska, I have 
what I call tale of two states. Uh, let me talk about Punjab where Dr. Norman Borlaug did his pioneering work and contrast that with the state of Bihar. So both 2009 as well as 2012 were drought years in India with rainfall deficits of up to 40 to 50 percent below normal rainfall. And uh, I was just looking up the statistics for 2009 and what I found very, very interesting was both Punjab as well, Punjab is in northern India, try imagine a map of India in your head and Punjab is in the northwest and Bihar is in the eastern side of India. And both these states had exactly the same amount of rainfall deficit, around 41 to 42 percent of rainfall below the normal. But in Punjab, there was hardly any reduction in cropped area. The reduction in cropped area was like 0.8 percent, while on the other hand in Bihar, the reduction in cropped area during the monsoon season was as high as 48 percent. So why is it that states which have similar rainfall deficits react so differently to that rainfall deficit? And the answer lies again, just as Dr. Lenton pointed out so well, answer lies in access to irrigation. It's just that farm, Punjab, farmers in Punjab have access to irrigation, both canal irrigation, but even more importantly, groundwater irrigation that gives them you know, reliable and timely access to it. And while in Bihar, and, and then there, there's such a paradox involved in it because in Punjab farmers actually pump water from depths of 100 feet or more while in, in the state of Bihar groundwater is available as a shallow depth of 10 to 30 feet. Good. Yet farmers. So we got a tale of two places, yes. both of them reacting very differently, the real point being irrigation. Do you know something about this subject of irrigation? I hope I do. <laughs> First, I, I'm, I'm honored to be here and I'm more than glad to hear the word irrigation at least three times. Yeah, positively in, too. Well, if, positively or negatively, uh, uh, something that p sometimes puzzles me, I, I do not attend very often international venues like this one, but, uh, I, but I do a couple of times a year, and it always intrigues me uh, how much time people can uh, talk about water issues without even spelling the word irrigation. Hmm. Now, it is especially intriguing if we, uh, if we agree that it, it's been widely accepted that uh, Irrigation is responsible for, and now I don't know how much science is behind the number, but uh, you can take any number between 60 to 85 percent, depending on the word, or the way people talk about water withdrawals or water consumption, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, in one way or the other, it is uh, widely accepted that irrigation is actually responsible for the way people manage water on this in this planet. And uh, again, there is no way to talk about water without talking about irrigation. And uh, I, I still wonder how little irrigation, per se, is at the top of the agenda of the international institutions, um, political, financing, et cetera, et cetera. So let me just uh, say a couple of words about uh, the presentation. I, I had the, the pleasure to hear yesterday uh, Dr. Conway's presentation, I believe, and the big question was, can we feed the world? And uh, his, his answer was uh, yes, if. I would add to that that uh, if we could run producing food as one business unit, the answer to that question would be an unconditional yes. But uh, this is not going to be the case in the foreseeable future. And then we have to deal with the normal imbalances that are always part of a suboptima system. And I look at that from a business perspective. We are uh, actually facing a suboptimal system that is here to stay. In other words, the water and food issues are and will be local, but they can benefit or suffer from global developments. And now I want to touch on, on the water and irrigation one. Uh, we uh, started predicating to the water issues since um, actually we came into being in, in the mid-60s. And by, by the way, I, I joined Nelofim only 23 years ago. And um, I must tell you that I am one of the few Israelis I know that did not invent drip. Uh, <laughs> guaranteed. <laughs> had nothing to do with that and actually joined a vibrant industry uh, that was already peaking. And, and, but it was only in the last five years that we in our business realized that looking for the real critical finite resources in this planet. The number one finite resource is arable land. And we still have plenty of room to deal and improve the way we use water. 
I don't, I don't want to go into that, but our oceans, runoff, storage, municipal waste, um, and, and many other factors can really improve the amount of available water even uh, in the short term. Arable land, uh, unless we find a way to uh, farm in the moon, is actually the uh, most critical and diminishing resource that combined with water actually presents the full scope of the challenge. And from a business perspective, um, once we realize that, we can only say that we believe, and now let me just, in the next few seconds, l let me take you through an imaginary journey. Imagine, imagine there is a way to improve yields between 20 to 200%, and that depends on the crop and different conditions. And imagine that uh, water can be saved in the range of 20 to 50%. And imagine that we can use much less fertilizers and pesticides. And imagine that we can just reduce dramatically pollution and land soil degradation by many different ways, runoff, low or no till, salinization of the soil, etc., etc. And now imagine that all those nice things can be done at once. And the fact is that uh, a system that can do all of that, not to 100% of whatever we want to grow, but probably to a good 20 to 25% of what, what we can grow on this planet, that exists. And the factors that limit the introduction of drip and micro-irrigation today uh, besides the fact that this is an innovation for most farmers, look at Nebraska. And by the way, there is a, uh, a very rapid introduction of drip, small scale in Nebraska, since the past three to five years. And, and the, the real limiting factor is the fact that people need to adopt something they don't know, and they need the support of probably governments and, and world institutions because irrigation, and I am just as my finishing remark, irrigation not as fertilizers, seeds, and pesticides is capital goods that require a significant initial investment. So from a, a pure business perspective, many or most other inputs are OPEX, operating cost. Irrigation is invariably CAPEX that requires significant investment. Private, public, Corporation can do much of that. Thank you. So you, you've painted uh, a really optimistic picture about what, what could be possible in a, in a better and more adaptive world. Aditi, take us back to your two states in India. Um, why, what makes the difference in uptake between one and the other, given the picture that is painted here uh, of really a much better outcome in crop. Uh, those two ch states have different wealth, but is the different wealth factor the major reason that causes the uh, differential uptake of new ideas, such in particular as the ones that uh, Gail is talking about? No, I think what really uh, the reason for the different outcomes is the policy uh, policies that the government, that these, water is a state subject in India, so every state government has different policies vis-a-vis -vis how water is to be used or how irrigation uh, is done. So basically in Punjab, what happens is even though Punjab has absolutely overexploited its groundwater resources, the government policies uh, actually provide free electricity to farmers that allows them to, the good thing is that that gives them a hedge against drought. So whenever there's less rainfall, they can continue extracting groundwater, but that obviously is not such a good thing. They continue to do that even in good rainfall years. While in contrast in Bihar, uh, even though groundwater is available at very shallow levels, what is happening is that the state doesn't have any electricity, so farmers depend on diesel-driven pumps. And it's just the economics of it does not make sense to you know, continue pumping. So I would think that much of the reaction is actually policy-driven. And also in Punjab, what's happening is that it's not as if the farmers are not reacting to scarcity. I mean, it's true that they get free electricity. It's true that they grow crops that are totally unsustainable given the water endowments. They grow wheat and paddy, and paddy is very water intensive crop. But what is happening over the time is that there is another set of policies, like electricity policies, 
So number of hours of electricity that farmers get have been whittled down to such a bare minimum like six to eight hours in the peak summer season that farmers are by default forced to economize on that water. And so in you're saying that the policy is really the absolutely central part. Absolutely. Roberto, you ran the International Water Management Institute, which before that was the International Irrigation Institute. So you've run an organization that was looking nonstop at irrigation decisions. Do you agree with uh, that assessment? Is is it, uh, is it policy? Is it having an enlightened government? Is it farmer push? Uh, what makes the difference between uh, the, the two states or the two parts of the world that start adopting change and those, those that don't? Well, policy is absolutely fundamental and I'm not surprised with uh, Aditi's conclusions in terms of, of, uh, of Bihar and Punjab. Uh, in the end, it's policies that make uh, farmers adopt uh, better technologies or better approaches uh, to conserve water. So if you don't have the policies in place, you're not going to have the incentives. Um, and uh, the slide that, uh, that Carl was showing of the farmer in the Murray Darling uh, continuing to grow rice despite falling groundwater tables, it seems to me it's a failure of policy. Uh, there wasn't an incentive in place for the uh, farmer to act differently. Miguel, is it policy or do you get farmer push? In, in wealthier areas, do you get farmer push to make these kinds of changes? Well, it is both, but policy plays a, a, a major role. And uh, I think I need to say that um, bad policies can abuse everything good we have created. And he, uh, Dr. Aditi was mentioning the way people can abuse the use of electricity. But does that mean that electricity is a bad thing to uh, be given to people? And I think that in the area of irrigation, we can see the same thing. We should not associate the water politics and water policy with the technology that can allow people to do things in a better way. In the Murray Darling, people may be using drip uh, to irrigate rice, imagine that. And that may be the wrong thing to do. Is drip to blame because of that? So policy is key. Okay. Well, you said technology, and uh, technology relates to research, relates to science. I'm going to take us back to Aditi for a moment and ch talk about one of the management elements of looking at the base case of uh, dry lands, and that is the existence of groundwater. Uh, and India is famous for exactly what she's been setting out. Our image is of uh, an overall country that is over pumping, uh, using free electricity, free water. Uh, but uh, there has to be better futures for groundwater management. And the first thing you need is some better knowledge about what's actually going on in different places. So Aditi, what's the future for groundwater management uh, in India, recognize that India is rather a large place. I think also relating it to droughts, what is absolutely imperative is the conjunctive use of groundwater and surface water. There is no denying of that. And what it can also... Uh, uh, so, so suppose it's a drought year and, and farmers would very legitimately and surface water supplies with, is, is not sufficient. In that case, farmers very legitimately depend on groundwater. But it does not mean that on years of normal rainfall or excess rainfall, they should still be as dependent on groundwater. But the policies, some of the policies are so, uh, so misconstrued, mis, uh, how do I say, uh, some, some of the policies are so bad that even in good rainfall years, farmers fall back on groundwater. So how can we provide incentives to farmers to make sure that they make use of both available surface water as well as groundwater? I think that would be the future for managing India's groundwater resources is to convince farmers and our policymakers to set up those kind of policies that actually help farmers, you know, wean away them, wean them away from use of groundwater in years when, when rainfall is normal. And in that way, build up groundwater reserves for them to use in years like like 2012 when rainfall was deficit. Is that an under unrealistic dream or has that been done in some places? Um, I would now like to cite the example of West Bengal where I think well, West Bengal is also uh, like a rain, it's like a water abundance state, so may not be exactly comparable with Punjab. 
But I think what the government of West Bengal has done is by metering electricity because groundwater is accessed using electric pumps and they have metered electricity which means that farmers pay a full cost for using that groundwater and that means that we found that after metering our study shows that farmers almost do not use groundwater in the monsoon season. Earlier they would use groundwater because they had to pay a flat price for electricity. So they would like use water, groundwater anytime. But after metering we find that they have do not use groundwater unless they absolutely need to do it. So I, I think putting those policies can help. And I think even Punjab has certain good policies in place, for example, rationing. It, it doesn't sound like a very good policy, but, but then because metering is not possible because the farmers really resist to any kind of metering and measurement of their water use. So the governments basically have fallen back to what is the second best and I think workable solution. That is if you can't price it, you ration it. And once you ration it and you create a scarcity, you, you send those scarcity signals to farmers, then they are also trying to make as efficient use of water as possible. So we find in the last five years, massive adoption of laser land laser leveling so that would improve water efficiency we find evidence of adoption of micro irrigation on quite a major scale in many parts of southern india in gujarat so just sending those scarcity signals to farmers either through pricing or rationing or some such way so would meter help. meter manage measure but send signals and try and change the political climate. Carl, how do you how do you create the kind of climate that will move suspicious farmers, irrigators who have learned over time they may not have as much reason to trust their public authorities as we would wish? How do you get them to accept? Uh, how do you get the general public to accept that difficult changes may be necessary both to get groundwater and to cut down on the switch to new irrigation methods that are less water intensive. I think there's one, uh, one word too, is, is risk. And another word that goes with that is investment. So identifying the big risks that we face, and China's seeing this right now. So you have this really interesting uh, interplay between the local, the provinces and the local governments and back in Beijing. So a lot of the local governments, they, their license plates are say, I heart GDP. And so anything that's going to stop, block their way in, in, in GDP growth is a huge challenge. And so near the border of Kazakhstan and Urumqi, China, it's very, very dry and they have glacial melt. They're building massive, massive industrial plants there and they also have large irrigated agriculture. Um, the farmers really don't have a voice in that right now because there's so much money coming in. But back in Beijing, they're starting to do the risk assessments. And they're starting to see that they need to do that investment in, in the agriculture and in their stability and their food security. So that becomes a communications tool. And so you say, here is a massive risk, here's, an, here's what's coming, here's a huge opportunity, and now if you want your water for your industry or your city, you need to invest in our irrigation and in our efficiency, and we'll share the water. And therefore, we'll have a little bit better climate um, in order to manage our water, our food, and our energy security. Well, you're a publicist extraordinaire. That's why Rockefeller reached out and found you. Do you know of an instance where a public authority or a coalition has got together and really done an excellent public, uh, public sensitization exercise to create the basis that, so that uh, political action could be taken and ultimately economic action could be taken? Yeah, I mean, I, there really is no, I'll talk more in general terms, but there really is no better opportunity than an inflection point. Like we said, a, a crisis. What ought to happen? What I'm asking happen. you what has <laughs> happened. Do you know of any really good campaigns that? Uh, um, as far as actual campaigns, um, no, I think we need, back to ought to happen, I think we really need to tell better stories and we need to listen better. And so that when Australia, it took Australia yeah. 12 years, it took the world to wake up yeah. to Australia for 12 years. The and you had the water Darling people singing, there is simply nothing like a drought. Exactly. You know, so they actually did manage to provoke some changes. Do you right. know of any changes where public policy has really created uh, the, the better knowledge base to get people to change what they're doing? Believe it or not, my answer is absolutely. And uh, I, this is a sensitive time to, to talk about uh, gov the role of government, but uh, ignoring the fact that we are 10 days away from some elections around here. Really? Uh, <laughs> well, there's a rumor. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. And let, let me give you a few examples. Central government in India and state government in India, state of Gujarat, 
where actually we operate one of our plants in India, is doing a fantastic job of uh, actually making the use of water. And by doing that, I, they actually optimize or at least improve the use of electricity in ways that are changing the face of agriculture in the state of Gujarat. It's not the only state in India, but it's probably the one at the forefront of doing that. The government of China is just doing a, probably a, um, a large improvements in that area, ways to go. And I would mention a third country, which is not always mentioned when we talk about irrigation, and that is Turkey. Mm -hmm. yeah. So good, positive, progressive programs that governments can manage. Preceded by public campaigns so that people understand. I mean, this is, the, this is what I'm really pushing about is uh, the need to get people on side so that they're not resentful and that they're welcoming of these change in as much as people can ever be welcoming of change. Well, there's no better public campaign than, than subsidies. So giving people money is probably a, a, a good way to That's campaign. probably what the government of India said to itself 50 years ago <laughs> when they put on the electricity subsidy. <laughs> um, We've got to create some grand coalitions here, and I'm going to turn to Roberto. Uh, what's, what's, the percent, what's the possibility that working with institutes such as yours or emanating from institutes such as yours, we can really form a coalition of the good things that we're hearing about this morning and start moving this cha the changes out into the larger universe? Le you know, that wonderful phrase, learning the lessons from the bad parts. Uh, what's, what are the potentials? What, uh, what are you thinking of doing for the next couple of years to try and make that a reality? Um, I think the word grand coalitions is, a, uh, is an absolutely the right word to use uh, in this instance. But if, if I can have your permission to give one additional example to the question that you were asking earlier, because I think there's a wonderful example right next door in terms of, uh, of institutions that work uh, in, in managing water effectively. And that's the natural resource districts that were established in the state of Nebraska 40 years ago. They were established um, before uh, Nebraska embarked on a massive uh, increase of its irrigation. Um, and they were local bodies where local farmers had the ability to elect uh, public officials to essentially regulate uh, groundwater within their, uh, their watershed. The impact of that has been that despite this massive increase in irrigated land, the amount of water uh, of, of withdrawal of, of uh, downturn in the aquifer has only been about 3%, uh, no, 1% uh, in, in those 40 years, as compared to other parts of the Ogallala aquifer that have seen very great uh, increases in drawdown. So I think we have really very, very good examples of, of institutions that work um, that, uh, that can make a difference over the long term. Now, on the question of the Grand Coalition, the reason why I say it's exactly the right word, because this is a multifaceted issue that we're talking about in dr droughts and drylands and, and the better management of water. It's multifaceted, and if we're not going to recognize those, those different facets, we're not going to make uh, a dent uh, in the issue. So we're going to have to get public and private institutions uh, involved, the public uh, uh, sector in terms of providing the right policies, the right institutions, the right incentives, but the private sector to come in with the technologies, um, the better seeds, the better varieties, the drought tolerant crops to be able to make uh, this work. We're going to have to have uh, work on, on uh, both technologies and policies to feed that. Uh, we're going to have particularly um, having to get the science uh, connected with the practice. Uh, and that's really what we're trying to do uh, in the institute that we've just established in Nebraska, connecting the science uh, of better managing water for agriculture with the practice uh, in a number of different ways. But there's 600 million very poor farmers or very poor farming units out there, probably very, very, very close to a billion. Um, how, how do they get access? to what you're talking about, because what you're talking about sounds expensive to me. And uh, capital resources are one of the things that these poorest, and particularly the, uh, uh, the rain-fed farmers, really have difficulty with. How do they get access? The, uh, the solutions obviously have to be context-specific. And what works in one place is going to be very different from what works in, an, in another place. And when you have 
very strong incentives and very expensive water um, and high productivity, you're going to be in a very different situation in terms of, of uh, technologies than when uh, you're in a different situation. Um, but part of this gra grand coalition is that you do have to work um, both uh, in addressing the problems faced by large holders um, and small holders. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a global world that we live in and this drought I think has, has sent a very strong message that if there, are, uh, if there is a, a deficit in water in the United States, it affects not only farmers in this part of the world, but it has implications uh, for consumers in poor villages in, in China, in India, and elsewhere. So, so we do have to think about how to be able to tackle the issues both of large holders uh, and small holders. That said, Clearly, the ones in most need, the most, uh, the most, uh, that have the greatest difficulty in access to better ways of doing things, are the ones that ha that, that deserve the uh, the greatest attention. Miguel, can you get what the miracles you're talking about to very poor farmers, and how? So, uh, if if I touch uh, on the smallholder problem, uh, I would say. To decode the smallholder issue probably is the greatest challenge that uh, people face. And uh, this, this has been done over the past 25 years and um, billions have been spent and the results are very disappointing. Now, an engineer will just give a simple answer to the, to the problem how to deal with smallholders, make them big holders, large holders. Uh, if you think about that, and I'm not referring to any type of social engineering, this is not a stupid thing to do. And here's where private public enterprises can come together and maybe make a difference. So we've heard Peter Brabeck from Nestle. Peter Brabeck, by the way, is doing a tremendous job promoting irrigation, efficient irrigation. And believe it or not, more than once, he can spell the word drip and talk to the benefits of drip. Now, look at the, at the inputs manufacturers industries. We have bigger and smaller. The whole irrigation business, all of us together, micro and mechanized, all over the world, this is a small industry. If you take them all together, maybe six billion US. That is 5% the size of Nestle. That is one and a half percent the size of Walmart. Now, if these entities, big food corporations and big retailers, being uh, Walmart, Reliance in India, Carrefour, Tesco. If we can come together, input manufacturers, and actually these food corporations have the ability to group smallholders. Again, it's not about social engineering. It's about creating buying groups. It's about creating cooperatives without changing the, the basic way of life of the smallholders. That can be, and I am very cautious about that because I think there is plenty of failures and probably no successes in that area. That may be one of the ways to try to decode the smallholder problem. Aditi, will that get to your smallholders? I mean, uh, West Bengal is not the richest area of the world. How, how are your farmers going to afford change? I think, I think there's a lot about farmers that is absolutely innovative. The only two key ingredients that farmers need are Im access to inputs and fair price for their crops. Once have they have these, they find out you know, amazing ways of making the best use of you know, all the resources that they have. And in my experience, farmers are always trying to maximize what is scarce. If, for example, in, in Gujarat, what is scarce is water. So in Gujarat, you see such rapid adoption of water-saving technologies. In West Bengal, what is scarce is really that arable land. You have very high population density, very little land, and their farmers are trying to maximize productivity from land, and they're trying to uh, crop three times in a year, three or four times in a year, and then they need access to irrigation. So just providing them with the inputs and not necessarily subsidize inputs at all time, provided that your output prices then are not depressed. But the problem with India and for most other places is that because of the overall uh, goal of keeping food prices low, our output prices are also suppressed artificially. Therefore, the need to provide input subsidy. But I talked to farmers in Punjab and I raised the issue of free electricity and they said, look, we really don't need free electricity. We are not beggars or anything. 
we just give us fair market price for our produce and we are ready to pay all the input prices. So I come back to my two key points, easy and affordable access to inputs and a fair price for the outputs and, and farmers can do amazing things. It would be interesting to run an election in India on uh, trying to change that particular seesaw. Uh, free input, or at least uh, freeing up the input prices in return for freeing up the output prices. Very interesting. We're gonna go to the audience and ask you if you have questions, but while you're moving up behind the, uh, the microphones, I take it the microphones are out there. We can't see anything from up here. We just have this, this sea of, of people. So uh, while you're moving behind the microphones, I wanna ask the panel, that, uh, is, there, is there something that either any one of you would really like to uh, bring up in response to what others have said or in the general subject of uh, drought and dry land before our, we start answering. The, Carl? Yeah, I just wanted to add too, and we, we talk about campaigns, and to come back to the earlier question, we usually talk about short term, a beginning, middle, and an end. Um, there is no beginning, or there may have been a beginning, but there is no end to the, these, these situations that we face. And in Las Vegas, interesting place to look at water issues. And it's fascinating because when they first uh, experienced drought more than 10 years, 10 years ago, a very serious drought, they brought the whole community together and said, we have to do something about this. We have to change how we're using water. They spent $200 million buying grass. And that's not laying grass. That means buying people's front yards and removing it. So finding ways to put water back into the Colorado River. And they now will claim that they have almost 100% recharge rate back to the Colorado from their buildings and from, from general Las Vegas operations, not including evaporation and, and other use. Ask me about the Las Vegas laundry if you want a good question. Okay, we've got somebody up there. Would you like to identify yourself, please? Yes, Norman Uppaw from Cornell University. Hello, Norman. Hello, and a question for Aditi. You were going to start to make a comparison between Punjab and Bihar 2009 and 2012, but didn't have time to talk about 2012. I think that in 2012, in fact, Bihar had like a 50% increase in its rice crop in the Karif season. Uh, Punjab continued to have this water stress problems of the lowering water table. In Bihar, they started changing their management practices, as you probably know, to the system of rice intensification. And about 10% of the area in Bihar now is under this management system. And it produced about 40 to 45% of that increase because the average yields were according to the Department of Agriculture, 8.08 tons per hectare versus usual two and a half to three tons. So the question is, can't, I mean, I'm not against irrigation improvement. If Roberto knows, I've worked on irrigation not quite as long as he, but almost. But I think there's a lot of scope for management improvements, especially using managed to get those roots in the plant down deep and be able to tap with the groundwater at lower levels. So you could say about the 2012 experience if you follow it in this comparison. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, uh, that's interesting because I was recently doing field. Should I answer yes, now? Please. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I was uh, recently doing some field work in Bihar villages, and every villager told us that the government has a new subsidy scheme on system of rice intensification, and farmers seem quite keen to adopt it. Not because I mean most farmers in my. Uh, experience adopted when they face some kind of water scarcity. In Bihar, farmers actually face very high cost of irrigation. So they took to SRI quite well. But again, my experience from the field was that all the, I wouldn't believe all the government numbers that are coming up because what the farmers tell me is that to take the subsidy, they actually plant a uh, like they take the subsidy for say one hectare of the land, but at the end they plant it for only half the hectare and once the inspector comes, they fix it. And uh, so, so I, I mean, I know that there has been adoption of SRI, but may not be as rosy a picture as the government of Bihar is painting it. But impact of drought in 2012 in Bihar was, was quite severe in spite of adoption of SRI. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, yes, uh, I didn't hear really anyone on the panel discuss the question of the pricing of water. Um, uh, could there be some comment about uh, technologies to have more cost-effective ways of measuring, monitoring, and pricing uh, of the cost of water uh, in order to drive the adoption of drip irrigation and lots of other techniques that would save the use of water? 
Thank you. Would you like to identify yourself, please? Oh, uh, Patrick Bins, Westbrook Associates. Okay. Who'd like to take that on? Miguel. Uh, <clears throat> that, that's not a good one for me, but um, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, I spent eight, eight years in the Central Valley, living in the Central Valley of California. And uh, I, I remember going to meet with uh, some of the water coalition groups, et cetera, et cetera, and people that um, supposedly care for um, the, the good use of water. And when we try to touch the price issue, the response was, uh, you do not understand what our role uh, is, do you? And I don't want to add to that because um, probably this has to do with the way the politics of water. Now, pricing water is, is certainly a factor. And let me say only that. We see response to the price of water or to the cost of water when the difference is extreme. And I, I am not telling you anything you don't know. People respond to extreme changes quite rapidly, and they are very slow to respond to slow changes. Just look at what happens at the pump when you have to pay more for a gallon of, 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 uh, of gas. When is it that people try to change their habits? In other words, only drastic things can change the way people uh, use water. Uh, are this uh, drastic change in order? I would just, uh, I would rather refrain to that. I think it's a very, as you said before, uh, context specific. I don't know that in India that would be the most advisable and the first thing the government has to do. Probably uh, um, the US and Australia and South Africa and mm -hmm. other countries will just provide different examples to that. Carl, you've been working with Google and others on big data sets. On, does the, do they include who's charging what for water? Um, we've been doing a, a survey on municipal water prices um, around the country, which uh, actually was covered in USA Today a few weeks ago, um, looking at price rates. Um, one thing I like to, you know, pricing is, it's, it's a hot button issue. Um, maybe something, of a place to start with that is valuing water. Um, you know, what value, how do we, it comes back to understanding the role of water, understanding, like you said, the, the farmers downstream. They said, you don't understand our role here. Um, and so I think what we need to do is, is also do a better job talking about the value of water. I live in the Great Lakes, and yet our, our lakes are down, but everybody, nobody believes that we're in a drought situation, and yet we actually shipped our honeybees out of the state because there weren't enough, weren't enough flowers this year because it was so dry. Kind of deflected my question, though, about whether anybody's tracking agricultural prices for water, which was. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know about agricultural prices. I know we're watching. We're watching the municipal yeah, municipalities. It, it's really a big issue because I can remember the Bangladeshis saying, "It isn't fair. We sit and grow. Uh, we, we we do agriculture next door to India, and they've got subsidized inputs, and we don't have subsidized inputs, and uh, we pay for water, and they don't pay for water." So. Uh, I'm just wondering if any institute in the world is actually tracking agricultural water price uh, prices and whether this wouldn't be a useful kind of uh, reference point to have. Uh, Aditi? Australia? Yes. Water markets in Australia actually uh, allocates water to higher value use and by default then prices water. So in, in drought years, I, I suspect it would any longer find farmers growing paddy in, in Murray Darling Basin because they might be just selling off their water share to farmers to grow, I don't know, flowers or even to, you know, cities and industries. So I, I, as far as I know, that might be one of the... Um, More water rate yeah. and things like but that. But then yeah. that's something that I don't think can be, can be imported to a country like India because, again, as Gail was saying, that for water pricing to be successful, it would have to be priced at such a high level that farming itself might then become an uneconomic affair, and that would not be politically acceptable. So if not pricing, I was thinking that there could be second best but equally smart solution, and the one that readily comes into my mind are, like, second best solutions work better in the developing country context. And I find that what does pricing do? Pricing sends a scarcity signal to farmers. And there are other ways of sending those scarcity signals. And that the way that the Punjab is doing, for example, or Gujarat is doing, for example, is just by giving lesser and lesser number of electricity supply, which means that farmers can pump less groundwater, so they have to get their groundwater work harder for them. And therefore, they adopt all kind of you know, water efficient technologies. 
So if you can't price it, ration it. So that's what India has been trying to do. Yeah, you're sort of contradicting yourself because uh, pricing doesn't have to be full cost pricing. It would be ideal. But as you said later, uh, pricing sends a signal about scarcity. And so therefore, uh, we shouldn't let the enemy, of the best be the enemy of the good. Uh, and actually starting to send some signals about water, uh, the value of water, which we go back to what um, Roberto and Carl were saying. I think we've got somebody else out there. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Dean Kleckner. I'm a farmer, uh, I'm former chairman of Truth About Trade and Technology. Uh, my dean is that my mother's name she gave to me. I got it honestly. I'm not a dean of a university, and it took forever. Uh, and uh, anyhow, but I am a farmer from northern Iowa, and on my farm, I had a lot of wetlands, so I, I tiled, I mean, they were called swamps, marshes, and bogs, and they're bad when their wetlands are good. I mean, I should have called it a wetland, and I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had to tile it. But uh, it was very good land, and I wanted to make it productive, so I, I put in tile. Uh, I've always thought that if you subsidize something, you get more of it. When you tax something, you get less of it. And uh, the, I, I've always thought also, my question was, and it's been answered, was on pricing. Uh, isn't, isn't it crazy to have nice green lawns growing in Phoenix and Tucson in the desert? But, so far, but those people that have those houses are willing to, to, make, uh, to pay for it. And are, are, we, are we wrong to tell them that it's bad? if they're willing to pay for it. That farmer in Australia that was growing rice, he was growing rice because the price was high and, and he could afford to do it. Now, whether he should be doing it or not, uh, from a water standpoint, I don't know, but he's willing to do it. Uh, and sh are, are you all willing to say he shouldn't be, he should be forbid from doing it? Uh, I, th I think the, the solution here, a lot of this stuff is simple simply have the government pass laws to forbid a drought, and uh, then, we, then we won't have any more. Here, Minister, here's your drought is forbidden paper. All you have to do is sign it. Good questions, heartfelt. Roberto. Well, it's a provocative question, and I'm sure that everybody has a, a, a view on this, but I, I think the issue that we have to uh, frame this question in, um, which hasn't really been mentioned sufficiently, is the question of sustainability. Um, and, and the reason why the farmer uh, in the murray Darling um, should be somehow induced to stop doing what he's doing is that in, over the long term, this isn't viable. Um, and it's particularly important when you're talking about groundwater. Uh, you certainly want to make sure that farmers have access to irrigation, but you, at the same time, have to make sure that they're going to have access to irrigation over the long haul for generations to come. Um, and so the whole question of preventing dry lands going to droughts means, in the end, conserving the resource over the long term. So you have to put in place policies that provide the scarcity signal, as Aditi was saying, that induce uh, those changes in behavior. Sometimes it's going to be outright prohibition. Um, and you can do that by regulating at least uh, new permits and so on. Sometimes it's going to be by the, uh, putting in the right, uh, the right price signals. Or repiping the system so that they're using grey water on uh, uh, much more efficiently and saying if you want to water your lawns, you've got to have a grey water pipe system within your house. I think that that, that question has a, has a very interesting facet that has nothing to do with irrigation. And, uh, I've been a member of the Irrigation Association in the U.S. a number of years, and I can remember having a discussion about whether or not it is good to promote irrigation in Phoenix, of all places. And I think one, one point was raised at that time, which in my, in my view is very worth uh, taking into account. Uh, and this is, sounds like a domestic issue of the U.S. It is not. Um, is it okay to expect, by ways of prohibiting, is it okay to expect from people that live in the Sun Belt to not have lawns and, and greens, et cetera, et cetera. So would you like most people move up to Boston or to Chicago or to Manhattan and just uh, say that if you want to live in Phoenix, you need to you know, put up with the fact that there's no water for, for your, your, water in your garden. So in other words, I think that regulation will have to look at, at that question from a much broader perspective than managing water. 
And that, that's all I wanted I'd to say. I'd be willing to say yes to all those questions. You don't get to shovel snow, you don't get a lawn. So uh, anyway, <laughs> that's probably why I'm not running the place. Yes, you have, uh, you have the next question. Yes. Please identify. Yes, yourself. thank you, ma'am. I'm Larry Dryling. I'm a senior editor with High Plains Journal, which is a farm and ranching magazine based in Kansas, but we serve 11 states in what America politely calls flyover country. <laughs> um, but it's the breadbasket of the world, and we also feed, if you eat beef or pork, it's where it all comes from. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Lenton, who I've never met, and I often go up to Lincoln for extension things and the like, but we've never met. Uh, I'd like to ask him because it's, it's a fascinating subject. We've been talking about drip irrigation in my neck of the woods for 25 years or more uh, in trying to use it at larger scale. And they've been trying to, and you mentioned NRCS, and this is what triggered it in my mind, was that about 20 years ago in four locations across the High Plains, uh, they tried doing drip irrigation on large scale for corn, and, for corn uh, uh, areas. And it was very successful, but it was just so expensive to try to lay down, to lay down the the uh, the strip. Do we think is it time now, uh, twenty years hence of that original NRCS pilot project, that we ought to go back and and revisit it, and um, try to do some sort of inve incentivization program for people to move away from from the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Center pivot irrigation systems and onto onto the uh, onto the drip irrigation systems that you, that have been touted here today. Thank you very much. Well, you you said you thought subsidy could be very useful in these circumstances, Miguel. Are you are you talking about that kind of circumstance? Uh, I would just say that, Dr. Lennon, can you uh, answer that question? Uh, let me make one remark. The system economics of corn didn't work for drip ten years ago. With uh, two dollars a bushel, it won't work. Four dollars a bushel. It does work. Six, great. Eight, unbelievable. And this is what we see today. We don't want those prices, but well, yes. Uh, yes we, we, right. do, we do not dictate those yeah. prices. Yeah, thanks. But, uh, it, it's a great question. Um, and I, I should say I'm not an expert on drip irrigation. Mr. Eisenberg is. And so I'm glad that uh, you addressed that question. You might want to go further into it. Um, what I see as being very interesting uh, in happening in in, in, uh, in this area of Nebraska, uh, which I'm, I'm new to, so I should, uh, I should emphasize that. Most of my experience has been in the, in the developing world. But what is fascinating is that there's been a two-stage adoption of technologies. The first stage was adoption of the center pivot irrigation that are the characteristic of this, of this part of the world, these large uh, center pivots. The second stage has been more adoption of information technology, uh, which is soil moisture sensors connected with mobile phones that allow the center pivots to be able to distribute the water more precisely in relation to the, uh, the needs of the, of the crops. Um, and so you have, um, I think, uh, uh, an evolution of technologies that I would say at this point it's much better to allow that second stage evolution of technologies then to start advocating uh, a whole new approach. And it seems to me uh, it's a more practical solution in terms of, um, of what is already in place and the investments that are already there. But again, on the drip irrigation system, I would beg to, uh, to offer my colleague here a, a, a chance to comment. And he did. He said they're highly price sensitive, which I think is a very good answer. Our last question from the floor, because I want to do it a little bit more just with the panel. You have the floor, please. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Chris Johansson. I'm a uh, professor emeritus from Purdue University. Uh, one of the things that I think we're overlooking is that the family farm exists completely different today in the U.S. It's a family business. Uh, they've incorporated. Uh, they're, uh, uh, they all have accountants. They have lawyers. and. Uh, I own a, uh, a farm in Nebraska. It's a little over 300 acres. Uh, our uh, tenants uh, started out 22 years ago when we first signed up with them with about 500 acres. They now own somewhere over 8,000 acres. 
And this is all because of our tax laws. They take the money that they receive and invest it back into the business. They buy new equipment, they buy uh, grain storage so that they can hold the grain until the market is up at the right price. I mean, this is, we're talking cooperations here among the farms. And so the whole farming complex to me has really changed, you know, and a lot of it's just around tax laws. I wonder if you'd comment on that. I think we could all say yes. <laughs> Anybody want to make a particular comment? I think it's the case. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, you, you made a good comment, and I think there's nobody that would uh, dispute this. We've got five minutes left, and I want to come back to the panel. We've talked about dry land situations and how to ameliorate them, particularly through irrigation, but also through different farming methods, in effect so that we don't have economic disasters, but also so that that land does not move into desertification. I want to spend the last five minutes really talking about how we forestall uh, the creation of dry lands. How do, we, how do we forestall desertification coming from dry lands? How do we forestall dry lands coming from what were previously uh, much better watered and more resource endowed places and where the rainfall is not particularly changed? Uh, you must have all seen this in your life, and we've talked about ameliorating and, and living with the situation that's there in terms of agriculture, but what do we do uh, to try and tr hold back the creeping desert and, and hold back the spread of drylands where these are increasing in size and scope? Carl, you look sure. like you want to start off. Well, actually, I, I grew up on a farm in, in northwest Michigan, and there's nobody more resilient than farmers. And at least in the U.S., we used to make huge investments, and we still do, but not, not to the scale in our, we talked about this last night, it, the scale of research and the scale of commitment. Um, and so we're, we live in a very exciting time where the world is a click away and where it isn't a click away. We have these great technologies for monitoring soil. We have uh, some incredible policy research going on. I think we need to do a better job communicating against uh, what, against and with ourselves, but communicating with Washington, with policymakers around the world that these are big risks and there are huge opportunities for investment and that we're resilient and we know how to forestall this or actually how to respond and be much more productive and fix some of these problems. Roberto, you've given a lot of your life to thinking about this. I, I think a lot of it um, has been in a sense, uh, part of the reflections over the last uh, hour have gone at this, but in my view, this is in the end a combination of technologies, policies, and institutions. Uh, on the technology front, uh, in the end, we've got to find ways that farmers um, can uh, do more with less, um, and that in the end means uh, more efficient uh, use of, of water, um, uh, coming from the water side, but it also means uh, doing better on the plant side with more drought tolerant crops uh, and so on. So you need to have the technologies available to farmers. You need the policies to be able to send the right signals for all the reasons that Aditi and others were mentioning earlier, uh, to provide the incentives uh, for, for the farmers to um, adopt appropriate approaches. But you need the institutions, and particularly you need the local institutions, because if you're going to think about long-term sustainability, in the end you've got to provide for a mechanism where uh, uh, those that live on a common watershed um, can recognize that their common future is at stake and put in place the measures that are going to allow uh, the sustainability of the resource over the longer term. And we're leaving out a lot of very problematic areas. The whole Sahel turning into the Sahara is a balance between the pastoralists and uh, between the sedentarized uh, farmers. The conflict that goes on, the impact of, tr of uh, herds that uh, are using land that they've never used before, uh, that this is having in many cases a devastating effect on the ability of the soil to then hold water, uh, to be trampled down on the water use. There's, there's some very complex things out there. We've been talking about the world as if agriculture was uh, really a question of growing 
uh, crops in the ground. There's other kinds of agriculture. There's the whole biofuel issue and where this is pushing into lands uh, that shouldn't be being used at all. Uh, and that is also promote, promoting dry land and, and possibly desertification. So uh, we have covered one area very well, but we've certainly left off some very complex areas around the world that are indeed pushing towards both uh, dry lands and in some cases to desertification. Give you each three quarters of a minute for a, a closing thought, uh, Gail. Okay, let me connect the desertification issue with uh, producing food. Uh, I'm no soil scientist, but I, I think that it will be very difficult to bring um, um, unproductive land into productivity again. And here we are trying to figure out how to um, increase food production by 50% within 30 to 40 years. I think yesterday we had the opportunity to see a, a great, in my opinion, a great tagline for that project. That is sustainable intensification. By the way, we call it sustainable productivity. We will not be able to, put, to bring into production much more arable land. What we can certainly do is make each piece of land and each unit of water more productive. I think just in, in uh, three or four words, uh, doing more with less, which is the point that Gordon was making yesterday, is absolutely equally valid for today's session. That's, that's, that's what we have to do. I think I'll sum it up as first, I, recognizing that this is a serious problem, then the political will and absolute the important role of governance, that you know, right political will and the governance that can play in solving it. That's how I'll sum it up. Okay. And to build on the policy, the institutions, and the technology, also listening better because our indigenous peoples and our farmers around the world, they know what the challenges are, and oftentimes they have experienced or know um, how to help solve them. Well, I pulled four lessons out of this, out of the many, many rich contributions that were made, uh, that it is possible to have drought without catastrophe but it isn't possible if we do things the same way that we're doing them in all the places in the world. So what we're trying to remove is catastrophe, not necessarily drought. We also need to work on drought, however. Another message came from something Egal said, only drastic things promote change because policies change as a result of emotional change. Uh, and it takes very real, um, very real pressure, very real stress to actually drive the climate to make change possible. The word subsidy is not always a dirty word. Uh, uh, we had two people who thought the subsidy was really going to be necessary to take some of the measures to use less water, i.e. to uh, get more out of irrigation systems and put in new ones. Um, and the final thought that farmers are a very innovative lot. If you help them with inputs, they'll probably increase outputs on their own with a little input, as long as that input includes knowledge, capital, etc. So uh, I think we've had a rich and very interesting morning, and I'd like you to thank very warmly our panel for giving us that morning.